It's good to be among you this morning. We're here to hear God's word, to worship him. And I'd like to uh, read to you from John chapter 11, that famous passage on the raising of Lazarus. And we'll read a good portion of this. I encourage you to open the word. John 11 will begin at verse 1. Now there was a certain man, he was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, of the the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night... He stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I'm glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Thomas called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes. Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here, and he is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but he was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, 
for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out. His hands and feet were bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. So far the reading of God's word. If I were to ask you the question, why was the Gospel of John written? What is the purpose of the book of the Gospel? Uh, You would have to, you could come up with many things, but it'd be good just to listen to what John said the purpose was. And he writes about the purpose at the end of chapter 20. And it says there at verse 30, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Jesus did many other signs. Lazarus was that last great sign that John records. And the leaders of the Jews recognize what Jesus is doing, that he is doing signs. And because of that, people are believing, and because of that, they want to kill him. The Jews are not skeptical skeptical about his signs. Oh, the fact, well, did he raise him from the dead or not? No, that has happened. What are we going to do? we got to kill him. True? Very true, because if we don't do that, we are going to lose our place. We are going to lose our nation. And that means what? Death. Our death our national death. So that means we need to get rid of this Jesus, this sign-doer. Well, let's walk through this story this morning, a familiar story. And I want you to think about this story for for a moment from a different position than you normally read this story. Because the Gospel of John was written, why? So that you may believe. So who is the principal audience, the principal listener, the original listener of the Gospel of John? Believers or unbelievers? Unbelievers. It's so that the unbelievers would believe. So, And it's for us. I trust we're believers here if you're not. Well, you're going to, we pray you can believe, right? And as believers, we pray that we can be encouraged and built up and reminded of the great life that we have. So it's written also for the unbelieving ear, so that the unbelieving ear can have ears to hear and receive life and have true hearing. So this passage is not really a passage about Lazarus. It is, but it's more than that. It's about someone else. The Lord Jesus. We're told at the beginning that Lazarus is a great, great friend of Jesus. 
and Mary and Martha. And in that ancient world, to have Jesus as your best friend, to have him over in your house where you could tell your friends later on, yeah, we had Jesus, he slept in that little hut over there and he slept in that bed. You're sleeping in Jesus' bed. He slept there one time, you know. He's our friend. What a friend we have in Jesus, right? We have him. And you know, he does all the miracles, but you know what? We don't need life insurance or anything because we have Jesus. He healed the eyes of the blind man and Lazarus is sick. And we will send our messenger, send one of the boys from the village. We know where Jesus is, down country or wherever, and he'll go tell him. The sisters sent to him, verse 3, saying, Lord, he who, whom you love is ill. Jesus says this sickness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Jesus is absent from this. But he is absent from this situation for a great and glorious purpose. The disciples, it's interesting how Jesus is so cryptic here with his own disciples. He wants to go to Judea. The disciples are afraid. Uh, they try to instruct him, to remind him what happened last time, that they almost got stoned. And you want to go there again? We are going to die. Jesus reminds them who they are walking with, that they are walking with the one who is the light. And when you walk with the light, you will not stumble. And then he just says it plainly. Lazarus is asleep. Well, that's not quite yet plain enough. And then, well, Lazarus has died. Verse 14. And notice what he says here. And what I want you to see in this entire passage is, is this theme of believing. So if you have your Bible open, just, just look. Verse 15, it says there, And for your sake I'm glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. Scan down to verse 26. And everyone who lives and believes in me, the word believe, shall never die. Do you believe this? She answers, yes, Lord, I believe. You scanned over to verse 40. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Then verse 42. That they may, that they may believe that you sent me. And then in verse 45. Um, Many of the Jews therefore would come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. And then verse 48. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. John's getting our attention. Believe, believe, believe. Faith is so important for life. And we speak about the three aspects to faith. You have to know who Jesus is, right? You have to know who he is in his person and in his work, right? You have to agree, you have to assent, you have to agree to, to that being true. And then another part of faith is trusting Resting all of our life in Him. Now the devil can know who God is, right? He might even agree that it's true, but because of that he says, I'm going to present the opposite of that. I'm going to present the lie, right? Some people can have a whole lot of information about God. I believe, I believe in God. Yeah, but you're not trusting in Him. You're trusting in King me in yourself, or in your government, or in whatever it is. And so Jesus here is presenting himself so that we might believe in him. That's what the mission of Jesus is in the death and resurrection of Lazarus. Jesus says here in verse 14 to his disciples, verse 15, for your sake, I'm glad I'm not there. You see, the death of Lazarus wasn't about Lazarus. Sorry, Lazarus. 
Sorry, Mary and Martha. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. You know, we live our lives so, much, so often that our life is about us. And our life is to be lived for the glory of God. And when we discover that, we have discovered freedom. Freedom in Christ. And that's what Jesus wants his disciples to know. He wants his disciples for their faith to, to, to realize more and more who Jesus is. And maybe this morning, that can be for you also. Who is Christ? Maybe you need to be reminded. Maybe you need to be encouraged. Maybe you need to be rebuked. Maybe you need to be warned. Jesus is the living Son of God. Are you believing that? Are you inspired by that? Are you finding your joy in your life in that? Thomas, let's go that we may die with him. Jesus had been teaching these disciples for three years. Right? What's Thomas' faith like here? It's not great. <laughs> right? Not great, Thomas. He, you know, Thomas, we're going to find him at the end of the Gospel of John, right? And we're going to get a great confession. My Lord and my God, right? Thomas, come here. Poke, touch, see. But not right now. Not right now. Thomas is with Jesus, but he is not yet realizing who he's really with. You're with Jesus, true, in your life, in your situation, in your church. But do you know who you're really with? They come to Bethany, verse 17. And Lazarus has been dead four days. It's right by Jerusalem two miles off. And the village and the community, friends, they're there. Uh, when we were in Africa, short story, we had a man, one of our former guards had been shot and uh, we had tried to save his life. We brought him to a hospital, he died. We took him to his home, his body, and the ministry team that we had uh, ministered to that whole village area for many days, similar to an Old Testament, what we have here. And some of our ministry guys, they came to me a number of days later. It was like four, five, six days later, and everyone would just sleep at that family's house on the dirt, on tarps. And... I asked them after, you know, four or five days into this, I said, so how's it going over there? He says, you know what, we just had a whole bunch of people show up like four or five days late. I'm like, oh, I'm thinking about this passage. He says, yeah, I really hate it, Pastor, when people come late to these things. And I thought, oh, why is that? He says, you know, they come and then everyone starts going crazy. You know how uh, Middle Eastern uh, funerals can be. Everyone is exciting and grieving and showing all of their emotion. And women are they're they're running out into the bush, pretending that they might kill each other, kill themselves, and they're tackling them. And it's just a gong show. And then we have to get them all back and settle them all down with God's word again. They came late. I'm not sure what that. If that's like this, perhaps. But this was the friend, the supposed friend of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, Jesus and his disciples, and they come four days late. Now remember we said earlier, listen to this with, if you have an unbelieving ear, 
what would this look like? Or what would this, how would you see this? Here's this Jesus, you know, I know Mary and Martha have been talking about how much Jesus is such a good friend, but look at this. The great miracle worker, and he's, he hasn't arrived. I thought he was your friend. I thought he could do miracles. We even heard before that he did a miracle at a distance. Remember the Roman, like, if you just say the word, it will happen. Martha hears that Jesus is coming. She leaves the home and meets Jesus. Verse 21. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She knows Jesus could have done something. She is, her faith is believing that Jesus could have done something. But you notice more than that. You see, in contrast to Thomas's, you know, let's go that we may die, uh, Martha has faith. We remember that this has been written so that we might believe. And Martha is believing. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 22, but even now, she says, this is four days. Even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. This is a remarkable faith of a woman who is in tremendous grief. She lost probably her only brother, would seem. Tremendous grief. You think of times when you've been in, in that place. But faith is alive in that suffering, in that agony. Now, what does Jesus say? Just wait, Martha. I, I got this plan. In 15 minutes, we're going to go to the tomb, and it's going to be all good. Start cooking food. We're going to have a par- party. No, that's not there. right? How does Jesus move through this? He, he says, first of all, he, he gives her Scripture. He comforts her with the Word of God. Verse 23, your brother will rise again. Jesus speaks of the bodily resurrection. And uh, he comforts her with Scripture, just like we do at our funerals. We know that the body will rise. That's why as Christians we treat the body with respect. That body has been made in the image and likeness of God. And Jesus came for our bodies. That body will rise. Jesus didn't just die for your soul. He died for your body. And Lazarus, he says, your brother, he's going to rise. Martha responds with this statement of faith again, verse 24. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Martha is not from the Sadducees side of things that didn't believe in the resurrection of the body. She's from the school of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees had that part right. They didn't have everything right, but they had that part right that the resurrection of the body was biblical. And Jesus is saying it's biblical. And Martha is saying, I agree and I trust. I look forward to that day. And that's something for us too, right? We are believing even as our bodies are getting older and as we put the loved ones that we have in the ground, we know that that body will rise at the resurrection and walk on the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth. Jesus walks through those biblical verses. Martha responds with faith, I know. Then Jesus does something very remarkable. Martha has given her first confession of faith. She is totally dependent on the great promises of God, she's resting, she's trusting. And then we have verse 25, and I trust it's a verse that we all know. 
right? We are familiar with it. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus here is seeking to draw Martha's focus from the, what we might say the abstract theological doctrine that we believe in the resurrection of, of the body, He is drawing her focus to him. I am the resurrection, Martha. I am the life. Jesus preaches himself. No preacher is allowed to preach himself. True? True. Only Jesus can preach himself. And this is what he does here. And he does it to a woman who is in terrible grief. Maybe you might say she's mentally not doing great. She maybe hasn't slept. Now, if you were an unbeliever, and you, this was all private, but if you could look in and see what was going on, what would you think about what this Jesus was doing to this woman in her grief? Is this a good thing? Probably not. Who, who, excuse me, what did you just say? Great teacher, that you are the resurrection, that you are life. That's some pretty big words. That, that is some pretty big claims, true? that if you were a Jew and you were not believing, you would say, that is blasphemy. If you are believing in me, Jesus says, you will never die. Are you believing that today? I will never die. Who are you? Well, I'm getting older. I'm going to, one of these years. But let me tell you something I'm not going to die. Because life has come to me. Scripture says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. That's the power of the life of Christ in us and in his church. And as you've come here this morning, uh, we, you need to be reminded of that. You need to be encouraged of that, with that. Was because you are called to live in this world. A world that is dying and that is going to hell. And a world that needs to hear about Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? He puts the question to her at the end of verse 26. Right? Here's Martha in her grief, right? If you're a counselor, like you're not supposed to do this maybe to these people in this moment. Right? Push yourself on them. Push big ideas on them. Push yourself on them. True? Not true. Jesus does it. He gives her himself. And in doing so, he is, he is revealing to her, he is revealing to us who he is. And he is showing us how much, listen, how much he loves us. Because he is the one who will give his life for us so that we might live. And here we have Martha give her wonderful profession of faith. Just like Peter had his and Thomas will have his later. She she says in verse 27, Yes, Lord, I believe you are 
the Christ. You are Messiah, the Son of God who is coming into the world. While we keep moving, Martha sends for Mary. Mary comes. The people who are there from the house, they follow. They think that she is going to the tomb to to weep there. Mary comes to Jesus. You picture it, she falls at his feet in grief. And she weeps and she cries and she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now she doesn't say what Martha said after, yet even now I know she doesn't say that. But here John gives to us, he shows us the heart of our Savior. The heart of our Jesus. The one who was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The one who could laugh with those who laugh, rejoice with those who rejoice, and grieve with those who grieve. Jesus who knows our sorrows more truly than we ourselves know. John tells us that he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. That is the heart of God for his people, the heart of God for this world. So much that God sent his son to die for us. Where have you laid him? Come and see. Jesus sees the tomb of his dear friend, Lazarus. And boys and girls, you know this is the shortest Bible verse in the Bible. Verse 35, Jesus wept. You see, Jesus was and is and forever will be a true human. And true God. And as a human, he has true human emotions without sin. And he grieves appropriately. And it is left without a doubt by the Jews as they observe this. Uh, they, 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 there can be no discussion now that Jesus did not love Lazarus. We were thinking earlier, you know, we were wondering, he showed up four days, right? Four days late. But now, but now I, we're, we're seeing that. He's, he loves him. But, you know, John tells us, verse 37, you know, he, he opened the eyes of the blind man, people are saying. John tells us what people are saying. Couldn't he have kept this man from dying? That's what Martha had had thought. If he had been here, that's what Mary had thought. If he had been here, the people are saying, couldn't he have kept this man? Does he really love? Does his love have power to keep us from dying? And you better say yes, right? If you believe in me, Even though you die, you will never die. Jesus is our life, loved ones. Jesus comes to the tomb, verse 38. It's a cave, we're told, the stone is against it. And Jesus says, take away the stone. Now, pause, we we know the story, we can run to the end, just slow down, right? Take away the stone. Now, from the position of unbelief, you're one of these skeptics. You know, there's probably a few of you here today. Right? You imagine yourself there. You know, the guys come four days late. We're now hearing about, he said he's the resurrection and the life. I mean, let's think about this for a moment. You're doing the unbelief skeptic thing, right? Let's just stop. 
I mean, these, what, what does this family need? They need comfort. They need some food. They, they need people around them. You were, you were late. We're at the tomb. I mean, you want to do your theology stuff and all that? Okay, fine. But can we do it later, maybe? Uh, they've lost a loved one here. And excuse, what did we just hear? We're at the grave, and what did he say? Take away the stone? Did he just say that? Did, did we hear that correctly? Take away the stone? Uh, these people are suffering enough, okay? Will someone from the family please say something to their friend, Jesus? We just need to go back to the Bethany. Let's go back, sit down, sing some songs, right? Take away the stone. Will someone from the family please speak up? Well, we know from Mary and Martha's story earlier, right? Busy Martha, hardworking Martha. She'll speak up. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Oh, she's taken science class or something, right? Right? Uh, thank you, Captain Obvious, for that piece of information. Right? It's influential. It's an indirect way of saying this is not a good idea. There's going to be an odor. Okay, good, Martha said it. Whew, that could have gone bad, right? But there are people there with faith. And Jesus, to the response of Martha, says, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And there are some people there, they're like, you know what? Martha must have said, you roll it. Mary said, you roll it. Boys? So they took away the stone. And then what happens next? Don't look at your Bible. What happens next? Does Jesus say, Lazarus, come out? No, he doesn't say that yet. Often you think it, you, we can miss the next part. Okay, what happens next? You know, the stones rolled away, and Jesus, we're told, John tells us, he slows it down, he lifts up his eyes, and he prays. Now at that time, Lazarus is coming out. But it's the smell of Lazarus that would be coming out. The smell of death it became a very familiar smell to me in Africa. The smell of death, of bodies. And Lazarus was coming out. The smell of the curse. And Jesus prays. The stone has been opened and these people are... Some are maybe hoping, believing, wondering. And some are not. And some will believe. And what does Jesus pray? Listen to his prayer again. But listen to his prayer as if you're not believing. Okay? And, and it's very, very interesting. Father. Okay, you're over here. You're looking at this Jesus, and you hear him say, Father, who do you think you are just talking to God like that? Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Oh, so this Jesus thinks that he can just talk to God like that, that he hears him. Who does he think he is? Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. Ooh, he thinks he's really big, right? If you're an unbeliever, 
That's, this guy thinks he's really something. And he has put this whole family now into, they're going to have a terrible day. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I say this on account of who? On account of the people standing around. And you're looking at that and you're thinking, he's praying about, not about Lazarus. He's praying about me. Me, the unbeliever. I say this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. You see, this whole story about Lazarus is not about Lazarus. It is, but it isn't. It's about someone even greater. And it's about Jesus. And then he cries out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hand and feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Who are you looking at now? If you're standing over here and you've been the unbeliever, Right? Who are you looking at? You're looking at Lazarus, like, ay, 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 right? But then you look at, who is this? Who is this Jesus who prays to the Father and says, Father, I know that you hear me. I know that you always hear me. And I want the people here to know, to believe that they may have life. We need to be looking at Christ, loved ones. We need to be finding our life in Him. And if we have our life in Him, we will find our mission in Him. True? It's very true. And it will reprioritize our life. And it will give us a great confession in our life. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we're told here in verse 45, many of the Jews believed when they had seen. Jesus would later say to Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. That is us. That is our message. If there's anyone here today that is not knowing about Christ, here he is before you in all his glory. And the skeptics saw this great sign and they could not deny that this very thing had happened and because of that they wanted to kill him. And that's what they would do. But little did they realize that the cross was the way that Jesus gave life to us as he paid for our sins. And as on that Easter day, as he rose again from the dead, he conquered death for us so that he is the embodiment. He is the source of life itself. And he is the one who has the power over death. And so when you look at this story, you may see one resurrection, the resurrection of Lazarus. But there's a lot more life happening than that. Many people were coming to faith. Many people became new creations that day. And many people had their whole lives reorientated to a king who was before them. He would change the nation. He would change people's lives. He'd make people followers of him. That's who we are as believers. And as you think about who who you are in Christ, remember that life has come to you and that you get to live out of that life. May God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. Amen.